entire room full of people by an unplanned presentation. Not completely unplanned at you know, 4 a.m. last night, but we got a slideshow together. She did. So, you know, shouts out to uh, the co-producer. Anyways, this is anime, as you can probably tell. It's just all of it, basically. Um, I don't think anything's missing. That's important. So, there you go. That's all, that's all of it. Uh, I think you forgot SAO. Oh, it's got to be in there somewhere, right? I don't know how old this is, actually. This okay. Welcome to the history of anime marketing. I'm glad there's only six of you, so I won't have to disappoint an entire room full of people by unplanned presentation. Not completely unplanned at, you know, 4 a.m. last night, but we got a slideshow together. She did. So, you know, shouts out to the, the co-producer. Anyways, this is anime, as you can probably tell. It's just all of it, basically. Um, I don't think anything's missing. That's important. So, there you go. That's all, that's all of it. Uh, I think you forgot SAO. Oh, it's got to be in there somewhere, right? I don't know how old this is, actually. This might... Most of these characters were big in the 2000s, so I'm thinking this might predate SAO. Um, but this is a... This is all of anime. Unfortunately, I can't tell you about the entire history of anime marketing, because obviously, uh, I mean, that would be insanely long. Instead, I'm going to give you sort of the Cliff Notes version of like the most important show. How they were marketed interested me, at least. Like the things that I looked at and I thought, huh, well, that clearly revolutionized how they did everything from that point forward. So it's probably worth talking about. Um, but we will not be addressing uh, Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh or Digimon or any of that because it takes, obviously, I could do a nine hour panel on that one. Like the amount, I, I could just sit here and list ways that Pokemon was marketed and it would last an hour. Like, they did everything with Pokemon. So, too much. I'm going to keep it simple. Start in the 70s. The Space Battleship Yamato, which is often considered one of the most important TV anime of all time. I mean, eventually it came out uh, sort of in this post-Star Wars era of space operas being, like, the big thing in cinema. And uh, this one was, well, initially not in cinema. It was a TV series, which was planned to go for... I want to say like 50 episodes, but it was cut down to 39, a story we're going to be hearing a few times over the course of this lecture. Um, however, while the, film, while the TV show was not like uh, as big of a success as they had hoped, they had a movie released for it where they recapped the entire thing in a couple of uh, films. And the films were extremely popular. The, the, uh, the, the box office numbers for the first movie blew those of Star Wars out of the water in Japan. Like, Star Wars was 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 defeated by Space Battleship Yamato uh, because it's extremely Japanese, if you can't tell by the fact that it's about a Japanese World War II uh, boat flying through the galaxy uh, fighting aliens. So, this marketing tactic of recapping the show into a pair of movies, which were literally just the show, they did not recreate it, they just took the show, cut it together, made a couple movies. But it obviously was a lot easier to follow than 39 weeks of continuous narrative. It also allowed them to cut a lot of the filler out of the show because there's like every episode has like minutes of them firing the big wave motion gun on the front of the thing and like stock footage reused over and over again. They cut all that out. The movie's, you know, a little bit easier to follow. So this tactic became extremely popular. Taking a TV show, which Remember, you know, we're before the internet. The only way you can actually watch a show is on TV. If you miss it, you have to catch the reruns. It was, you know, not easy to just follow a show that was continuous, especially over such a huge amount of time. Even if you were waiting on reruns, that's 39 weeks of reruns. You used to have to watch a Yu Yu Hakusho that way. It took a long time to get to the next arc in Yu Yu Hakusho, uh, <laughs> back on Adult Swim. Now I can watch the whole show in a week. It's beautiful. So anyways, the film was a big success. And following that success, they made, a, they made a ton of Yamato. They made like a season two, that, uh, they made like a, a second movie. One of them I remember, nobody liked it, and I think it was the second movie that nobody liked, and they like retconned it. They, just, they, they were just trying to pump out as much stuff as they could that was like this. And one of the things that came out around the same time, just a year later, is uh, Mobile Suit Gundam. Another mix, oh, well, that last one was a mix series, but another sci-fi war series that was you know, trying to be this epic space opera. Well, the unique thing about Gundam is that the guy who created it did not want to make the kind of robot shows that were, that were uh, highly successful at the time. Because in the 70s, robot shows were generally made for little kids. They were about big robots using crazy super attacks, 
blowing each other away. Now, a lot of people still like those shows because compared to like American kids' shows, they had really dramatic, involving narratives. Characters would actually die in some of these shows for kids. You know that that are also the ones where a guy shoots his hand out as a rocket at an edge. You know, but like that that kind of goofy discordance. It's just what it, you know. Japanese cinema is all about, really. I guess. I mean, pretty much all anime is like that. Shonen Jump is made for kids, but they tear people's hearts right out of their chest and crush them in their hands sometimes. <laughs> in like most of them, it happens in most shonen manga. Anyway, uh, so the Gundam trilogy. This is a film series that was a recap of the TV show. Not unlike Imato right before it, the TV show didn't run as long as they had hoped because it wasn't very popular. Um, it started to pick up steams when it was being rebroadcast, when people, you know, word was spreading, people who liked the show were talking about it. But they eventually recut it into not one or two, but three entire feature films. And this is where, again, the marketing tactic worked because, once again, it was easier to follow continuous narrative in a series of movies. This is still a thing to this day. You probably all know a few anime recap movies, Madoka Magica. Um, we're going to talk about that later. Ava, all kinds of stuff. But, Lots of movies that, that follow this formula of recap the show or add something onto it. A lot of these movies will just add in a couple extra scenes just to be like, hey, we know you saw the show, but don't you want to hear them say like, like some jokes to each other about what snacks they're eating? Like, you, you ever watch one of those OVAs for like a cute girls show and every single time it's just like them eating lunch and it's like an $80 Blu-ray for one episode, you know? I don't know why I'm talking about that. That's another marketing. That's hey, there, there you go. History of anime marketing. That's another one. Uh, just make a really bad OVA uh, where the girls are in swimsuits and people will pay eighty dollars for that Blu-ray. We're not going to get to that in this lecture. Um, but the most important thing about Mobile Suit Gundam is uh, that in order to tell this darker, more adult story that Tomino wanted, he had to kind of like wrap it in the package of a popular kids robot show. Because that's what the studio, Studio Sunrise, was doing in the 70s. They just made lots of robot shows. And they were like, look, we'll let you make a show. Of, we'll let you make your crazy show, because we're in a world where Yamato is successful, and Star Wars is successful. We'll let you make a space opera epic, but it has to have robots everywhere. So like every episode, they introduce some new robot. Uh, a lot of them are like, you, you don't care. You just like, skip this episode, please. Uh, you know, some people argue that the original TV show is better than the film trilogy because they left out some important stuff in the second movie. But um, for the most part, this just flows a lot better than the original, and they cut out all the filler once again. However, whereas, uh, you know, serious war filmmaker Tomino wanted his Gundam to be pure white, he wanted it to be a war machine and serious, they were like, no one's going to buy a pure white toy. So they, uh, you know, they gave him some paint. And this is the RX-78 perfect grade model, uh, probably like $200, but God, it's beautiful. Uh, any mech fans in here? Anybody a Gundam fan at all? Man, y'all need to learn about robots. Go watch some robots. Uh, so this leads us into the 80s. Gundam's big now, Yamato's big, and a new class of human being emerges, a new uh, sort of subspecies, us. Otaku, anime fans, we emerge. We're like, hey, this Gundam stuff's pretty cool, Shard. I like that guy. One does not care to be to acknowledge the mistakes of one's youth. Everyone's quoting at each other, like, this is around the time that, you know, the otaku subculture starts to form from people who love these, uh, these sci fi shows. So this show, Macross, takes those epic sci fi stories that were so successful with the last two shows and decides to market it at otaku specifically by uh, making one of the main characters an idol. A 16-year-old pop idol who saves all of space by singing until the enemies learn about the concept of love and uh, develop culture, because they're fighting a sort of warmongering race who has no culture. They, have no, they call it de-culture, and they're, they're disgusted with the concept of culture and love. However, as this war rages on and they find out about each other, you know, uh, bonds develop. So anyways, this show is, is, it's very like, it's very subtly directly aimed at otaku. Like, on the one hand, it is a compelling war drama where characters die and it's dark and serious and there's a lot of 
There's a lot of intriguing military stuff going on, but more importantly, also Pop Idol, and you can do a lot with that when it comes to marketing. Mm -hmm. Pop Idols have become a huge part of anime marketing over the decades because uh, it's you can you know the voice actor is usually also an idol. Usually some really cute 16-year-old girl who they can have put on tons of concerts and sing her songs that she made for the show. There's a ton of songs in this show. Uh, I can sing half of them for you, but I'm not going to at this panel. Come back for the after dark and, uh, and remind me. Anyways, so, uh, <laughs> so Min Mei here, yeah, like her, her voice actress, her voice actress is still putting on, performing these songs. She was at Otakon last year performing songs, or was it Anime Expo? Either way, I missed it, but she was, she was performing songs from the show, still famous, still a good way to market the show, show has a thousand seasons, still on TV, and they just went more and more hard with the idol thing as time went on. If any of you have seen any of the more modern across shows, like across Delta, where, uh, I don't, I actually can't summarize it. I'm like trying to think of how to put it into words, and it's just like a mix of colors and noises and like frenetic lights and people singing in mechs to pilot mechs. Like singing pilots to mechs, and also they transform. It's, it's, you know, it's a lot to take in. There was also this thing called the Itano Circus. I just threw this in here because it's cool. Basically this animator, Ichiro Itano, um, who uh, was first made famous for this this crazy effect he has of bullet or of, uh, missiles flying everywhere all across the screen and doing crazy loop de loops and stuff. Very popular, influential technique that, uh, that still comes up in anime constantly. I don't know what it has to do with marketing, so I don't know why I put it in the slideshow, but it was in my, uh, my run through that I did last night. So, anyway, continuing on this idea of like marketing anime specifically to anime fans, we have Gainax. Now I need you to understand that up until this point, the idea of like anime made just for anime fans was not really a thing. Like in the 70s, most of it was mainstream stuff. Those shows like Yamato and Gundam were not trying to be for anime fans. They were just trying to be for Japanese TV. But because this fandom emerged and that itself was a market and these people were so passionate, what the people over here at Gainax realized uh, was that they could just like market straight to that crowd and develop a really intimate relationship with them, which is sort of what Trigger's doing now, and it's why they're here. But, uh, and they're from Gainax, obviously. But like, back in the 80s, Gainax is the only anime studio, I think, that literally came out of nowhere. Every other anime studio has branched off from another one. All of them go, you can trace their lineages all the way back to like the first ones that were made by like film companies trying to make animation divisions. Gainax came out of nowhere because some rich kid who was a marketing genius uh, just kind of grabbed a bunch of cool animators from his area, I guess, such as Hideki Anno, the uh, director of Daikon 4, Evangelion, Nadia, Kare Kano. It's easy to do this when you have them all in front of you, isn't it? Uh, you know, he did stuff on Fuli Kuli, he directed Gunbuster. Anyway, Hideki Anno uh, was just some some really talented animator in college who was just discovered by this guy uh, who, who was called the Ota King, obviously because he basically created a talk of culture with this uh, thing he's doing here. But uh, this dude just gathered together all these animators and had them create these little short films for a convention called DICON, which is a sci-fi convention. That's the DICON 3 and 4 films. Um, through these, they were able, like, through just doing this, like just a college kid gathering a bunch of people and just making something really good, they could just show that to people and be like, look how good we are, can we have money to make something even bigger, you know? Like, as opposed to having to prove themselves by working through, like, lower level shows and doing assistant work on other productions, which is most of, like, how studios start out, these guys were just like, here's Daikon 4, it's really good, uh, we want to do the OVA, we're, we're going to do Gunbuster. And then you do Gunbuster, it's really good, everyone loves it, it's, you know, it's all good. It's all good until they made a movie called The Royal Space Force, The Wings of Honey Mize, which is one of the most expensive movies ever made, because in the late 80s, uh, marketing went out the window, it didn't matter. Japan had a bubble economy, um, everyone was just throwing money around. Like, marketing, not important. Just make the best movie imaginable. That's all anybody's trying to do. They're just like, we've got all the money, 
We're throwing it all at marketing. Um, Hayao Miyazaki had emerged at this point. Katsuhiro Otomo, who made Akira. Like, people are making artsy movies. The whole world's recognizing it. This is what we're doing. Let's go all in. So everybody's just throwing lots of money. If you watch a lot of like late 80s movies and OVAs, they're all insanely beautiful. They're all just like lavishly poured over. Every cell is animated and there's stuff moving in the background and it's aesthetically gorgeous. Uh, this killed studios, of course. Guy in X who sunk all that money in the Royal Space Force. It did not succeed. They lost all the money and they almost died. However, they are marketing geniuses. So when the age of marketing came around again, they were ready. So the Ota King, he wrote this two episode OVA. How many of you have seen Otaku no Video? Just you? Well, <coughs> Otaku no Video is two uh, hour or so long episodes that came out in like 1991. And it's a story about, a, pair, about a, a, a normal guy who's playing tennis in college. He's just like a, a totally fast-track, regular guy until he gets into anime. Ruins his life. All of his social, uh, but like all of his friends abandon him. His girlfriend leaves him. He loses his job because he's gotten fat and he's scruffy. And all he does is watch anime with his otaku friends and build model kits and stuff. Well, at the end of the first episode, after he's lost most of his life, he, he gets up and he's like, you know what, why, why should we have to feel like we're the ones who are abnormal? We should just take over culture. We should just like make anime culture into the mainstream culture and like make them all rue the day that they questioned us, which I then took as my entire life ethos. Yeah. However, this, this, so what happens in episode two is that they start building a company and the way that they do this is sort of Gainax showing you Here's how we did it. Um, they, they just produce all their stuff with a really small team, but they focus on beautiful character designs that they can sell. Because with the Daikon film, you know, the main allure of it was this beautiful girl. Is she up here? Yeah, right there, bam, on the sword. Uh, by the way, this was illustrated by Shigeto Koyama, who's at, he's literally at the trigger panel, or was, if anybody came from that, you just saw the guy. He drew this. We found that I, I literally ate dinner with that guy last night. Didn't know he was even here. And then we were like Google searching for this. Uh, and I'm like, oh my god, illustrated by Shikensu. That's, that's so cool. I just saw that guy. Anyway, um, so, you know, this beautiful girl on the sword is the main selling point. And it's worth mentioning that she is the first animated character to have her breasts bounce. That one has invented it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's called the Gynax Bounce. Um, so there you go. They, they bounced her titties and they made her really sexy and they made a bunch of toys out of her. And so she was really successful. So they, they basically had this concept of garage kits. And it used to be that, uh, whereas not even buy like a figure, you can drop like $150 and you buy like a beautiful, fully painted figure of a character. Well, a garage kit is like a really rough base model that has no paint. And the idea is you kind of touch it up and paint it yourself, but this allows for the company to just produce it themselves. They, because it's really easy to make these things. They're just made out of like a cast. So they kind of make a cast of the character, mass produce a bunch of them. They don't have to do the technical side. And the fans who buy these kind of figures love painting them and stuff anyway. It's the same thing as like Warhammer or something. You know, just go home and paint a bunch of crap. So, which I have no patience to do personally. I'm glad this era's over. But, uh, <laughs> But Gainax, you know, they, they made their own garage kits, and they, because they were so cheap to produce, and they could sell them for cheap, so people would, you know, the, the idea was not that they were insanely expensive like figures are. They are a cheap thing that you can then customize and make cool. So you can make it worth more than it was originally worth. And people would even resell them if they did really nice ones. Sometimes you'll see in a dealer's rooms where they'll have, like, repro or, like, original production figures where people, like, went really all out with, like, old garage kits. And, it's often characters from the 90s who, uh, who, who have just been resold, I guess, over the years across different dealer rooms. So they, they, they realized that marketing the character was like what they needed to do, market th this specific person. And so that's kind of where they would take things, especially in the 90s when we get to Ava. And I mean, I'm sure you all know the Ava girls. How many, who, who here has not seen Evangelion? You have not seen it? Do you know all the Ava girls? No. Nope. You couldn't point to them on this? No. Nope. You couldn't guess? Yeah. No. Wow. Um, Where have you been? Where have you been? 
I've literally been watching anime for less than a year. Okay, he, he yeah, but, he's new. But, hey. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get him there. Anywho, uh, these characters are extremely recognizable, is my point. It's because they put them on everything. They've made so many products. There was actually a, a panel that, that goes around, I guess, to conventions sometimes, uh, just listing all of the things that they've marketed Ava with. Like I said, I can do a Pokemon. Like, they're, they've put Ava on trains, they've made Ava stores, there's an Ava theme park, there's Ava, like, with any product you could buy, there's an Ava version of it. But even back in the 90s, the main way that they marketed, especially Ray and Asuka, who is the red-haired girl, for the two of you who don't know, um, is that they, they would just like release tons of art of them in different outfits, figures of them in different outfits, like, you can buy hundreds of figures of those two girls in like every style you can imagine. Every artist has done their own rendering of them that's become a figure. Um, the Monogatari series has kind of copied that with uh, like releasing figures based on like just popular pixiv artists and stuff. So anyways, yeah, they, they, were, they were really leaning in on the character goods aspect. And in the 90s, they, they indeed rescued themselves. They made Ava one of the most successful and influential anime series of all time. Um, Single-handedly created the genre of late-night anime, uh, like low-budget crap made to sell to otaku, so thanks <laughs> for that. Um, we also want to talk about Ghibli, because Ghibli came, out, came around about the same time uh, as Gainax. They were, granted, they, the people who were working there from uh, the oldest, most established studio, but the really talented people, Ayao Miyazaki, Isao uh, you know, they broke off and then made their own place and do their own thing. Um, I wanted to bring them up because they have kind of, I feel like Ghibli and Gainax were both trying to head towards the same conclusion and taking very different routes to get there. And the conclusion is just make anime better. Evolve the medium, keep influencing artists like putting money back into it, you know, uh, Ava, I didn't really, I don't think, we don't have a rebuild slide in here, do we? All right, I'll just talk about the Ava rebuilds, even though this is breaking the timeline. Um, so the, the Evangelion rebuild movies is where they took the series and decided to just re-release it again, but as a set of movies. The first one is literally just the first six episodes of the show reanimated and slightly changed for, for film. But then it really veers in a different direction with the second and third films. Um, but they've kept these movies in the theater, like they've, they've kept them for so long that it takes so long to come out, and in the meantime, they sell so much Ava product that, um, you know, if you're at my last panel, you know, my theory is that Kara is stretching out the release of these Ava movies as long as possible to keep the hype alive and to keep selling more stuff, and the reason they're doing it is so they can redistribute that money back into the hands of talented animators, which is why Studio Kara did the, uh, the Animator Expo, where they made like 39 short films with every like unique animator they could find under the sun. So ultimately I think that they're using the crass, commercial, otaku pandering side of anime to like low-key give us something good. Like, you know, they're, they're, they're paying us back for all our suffering by giving us real anime sometimes. Um, Miyazaki, meanwhile, just makes masterpieces and uh, has, does not accept less than perfection. The man will recheck every frame of the movie that every animator did and correct them all himself. He will correct, like, what, 70,000 frames? Does anyone know how many frames? It's one of those big numbers that always gets brought up when people talk about Ghibli. He checks lots of frames, is the point. And uh, Ghibli has just survived on the strength of marketing the fact that they are the best. Like, that is what the Ghibli marketing is, is hey, we are so good we are paralyzingly better than every other studio. We are the only ones who make sure every frame is perfect before it goes to print. Worship us. We are gods. No one else matters to you. And as a result, the natural, like, just kind of the natural result of that is that people really love their movies and products and will buy them and pass. You can find Ghibli stuff everywhere. It's crazy. I was in Boston recently. There was like a little store called Anime Zuka. And I went in there, and it was like just Ghibli stuff. And I was like, man, there's a, there's a lot of Ghibli stuff. They must make a lot of money off of these old movies. Um, and we'll talk about, I don't know if I have a slide about this, actually. But 
One of the things that's become increasingly important over the, uh, over the decades is the holding of original intellectual properties for studios. Because if a studio owns the rights to their own creation, they can do whatever they want with it. They can make their own toys, they can make their own whatever. Most anime studios do not own the rights to most of the shows they work on, because mostly they work with production committees, and those production committees usually hold the rights. Now, the reason that so many anime have been working with, uh, or so many studios have been working with Netflix recently, I don't think I have a slide about this, so I'll just talk about it now, is that uh, Netflix um, uses an old model of how they handle intellectual property. It used to be that when uh, a studio or a uh, production committee funded a studio to do a project, they would hold the broadcasting rights of that show for a while, but eventually the intellectual property would default back to the studio after a few years, and they could do whatever they wanted with the property. That's not the case anymore. Now, production committees just create a percentage for each uh, part of the um, group, you know, each person involved, so the studio, the producers, you know, whoever else is involved, toy companies, whoever's promoting the thing. They all get a percentage, it's never renegotiated, they never get the intellectual property back, which means that let's say that you make a show with Sony, Sony does a poor job promoting your show, it's an original work, your team put a lot of heart and soul into it, but they didn't really market it that well, nobody watched it, and it bombed. Now let's say that you think that your show has tons of appeal and that you need to do some promo for it. You're like, let me promote the show. I know what's good about it. Well, you're going to have to run everything you do through those companies and all the money you make off of your single-handedly doing this is going to go to them. So all your work is just getting redistributed through all these companies if, they don't want to, if they're just sitting on your IP. You can't do anything with it. So Miyazaki's precious with his IPs. Uh, they were really hesitant about letting anyone release these movies in the US, for instance, the first time that they ever did. Not so Valley of the Wind was released as a movie called Warriors of the Wind. Highly cut, very different dub, very different story. Miyazaki was not happy about that. And so they basically just set the price of their movies extremely high, and they were like, you have to be this serious about buying the rights to our movies. And of course, Disney was that serious, because they had that kind of money. But, um, you know, they hold on to all their IPs, they make all the money, so, you know, when you go out and buy a bunch of Totoro toys, you can at least be like, hey, I'm, I know Ghibli is getting some of this. Um, anywho, this is just a bunch of uh, post-AVA results, because right after AVA, there was sort of a misunderstanding, I think, that Evangelion was, I keep, sorry I keep pronouncing it differently every time I say it, by the way. Um, I think there was a misunderstanding that Eva was successful because it was weird and like deep and interesting. And I'm glad this misconception happened because in the late 90s, there was just a bunch of weird shows. All this stuff is super weird, super different, real interesting, way lower budget. Um, this is like what happened because of Eva, but none of these were that successful. Because Ava wasn't really successful because it was weird. It was successful because the girls are extremely attractive and they marketed it to, to hell and back, you know? Um, I didn't even talk about the fact that Ava also had the, the recut into movies thing, except that they did the weirdest format of it imaginable, which is they released two films. One is called Death and Rebirth. The first half of it is like a weird, jumbled recap of the show. And then the second half is the first half of the end of Evangelion, which is a movie they released two years later. So you can watch the first half of the movie after a recap of the show. You paid to go to the cinema to see this, by the way. Uh, and then, two years later, you finally get to watch the entire movie that you've been wondering what the hell happened there at the end of the first half for years about. But this is all just to milk it for all it's worth, and they all do it now. Every studio does this. You know, Guru Khan had a pair of recap movies where they only changed like the very end of each movie to have like a really cool fight scene. So you have to watch it. Like, it doesn't matter how if you like the TV show more and like it doesn't condense the information and therefore is better. Uh, you gotta watch the movie because man, those fights though. So, all right. Now we're gonna move on to the two most important anime of the 2000s, in my opinion. Uh, not these two, uh, but anyway, one of them is Death Note. Death Note is extremely important, I think, um, because Death Note is, is an anime that, to me, was crafted on every level with the sole purpose 
of being the biggest mainstream success in the world, and it worked. It somehow completely worked because the people who did it are just that good at doing that. Because they are just the masters of creating the most mainstream marketable product ever. And they tell you how they did it in this manga called Bakuman. Bakuman is from the same uh, writer and author duo as Death Note. It is a manga about writing manga, specifically for Shonen Jump, which we saw a lot of in that first slide. Um, so Shonen Jump is really fascinating because the entire basis of the, of the magazine is marketing. Literally, the stories that are in Shonen Jump are constructed from the ground up to last as long as possible. That is basically the goal of every Shonen Jump manga. Last as long as possible. So you need to construct a story that has legs that can go a certain distance. You need it to you know, sort of just be something that you can expand on week after week and constantly find new ways to twist it so that people will just keep reading it. Now, some of them are designed to have an ending, depending on the author. If there's someone like, the, the artist who, who drew Death Note and Bakuman is like a really long time jump artist who's done a lot of different series, but he always works with a writer, which is very rare for that magazine. Most of the time, it's just the writer is the artist. Because these two are kind of, they work with other people and stuff, I think is why they've made stories that have concrete endings, like Death Note's 13 volumes, Bakuman's 20, which is long for manga, but not necessarily for Shonen Jump. So anyways, this manga literally tells you every single crazy technique that they use to try to promote their manga from things like uh, cre just some of it's like more serious, like the situation for the characters is serious, but for the audience it's goofy. So like when you put a, a character in a, a scenario where it doesn't cause them to become a comedy character, they don't have to become a comic relief, but the situation around them can be comic, and that way the seriousness of the story doesn't get interrupted. There's a lot of that in the Death Note manga. Like you'll see lots of a lot of which was lost in the anime, but um, you know there's there's a lot of this serious comedy edge. There's a lot of these just narrative twists and stuff to keep your attention. Everything's built around these two iconic rivals who have like very basic, like broadly thematic ideas about the world. Like you can summarize each of their viewpoint in like a sentence. You know they're they're. Uh, what's the word for archetypes? So it's this battle of archetypes, a battle of wits, and most importantly, I think, four quadrant appeal. This is the most important thing about Death Note: is that it appeals to literally everybody. Uh, obviously, young women like it because Light and L, uh, who were two of the most popular Bishonen characters ever. Um, that's pretty boy. Doesn't know who we um, Then you've got. Uh, the fact that it, it appeals to young men, because the main character is a young man, you can relate to him. He's a super genius, so if you're like me and you think you're smart, you probably related to him right away. Um, and he's a sociopath, so, you know, a lot of anime fans probably look at that So, you've got, this guy, you've got this show that appeals to, to young people, but it also appeals to older people, because in spite of the fact that Light starts to show in high school, very little of it is set in high school. Most of it's set either at Light's house or in police bureaus. There's tons of adult characters. Light and L are really the two youngest, like, highly relevant characters in the series. So for adults, they were able to watch this show, and while they might think that some of the characters are a little basic, or that the story is a little cheesy, the, the higher level, like, you know, good versus evil conflicts of, like, hey, is it okay to kill people if it makes the world a better place? Like, this is the kind of high-minded idea that adults sit around discussing over alcohol or whatever adults do. <laughs> um, I wouldn't know. So, so yeah, they, 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 they had this four quadrant appeal, and then it was adapted to anime, and the anime took it to a whole other level because of a certain guy called Tetsuro Araki. Now, this man is another huge marketing genius. Not only did he make Death Note, which is like, probably the most popular anime? I don't know, it's like the most viewed on now. It's the one that uh, I see the most products for, so it's the most relevant for being almost 15 years old. So yeah, really big deal. But not only did that guy direct that, he also directed Attack on Titan, the second most popular anime. And he also directed High School of the Dead and uh, Cabinary of the Iron Fortress, all extremely successful shows. This man knows what he's doing. He is the master of making marketable shows. And the way he does it is basically just uh, very Hollywood. Lots of bright lights, 
fast moving images, crazy colors, bombastic music. He really like t takes things up to 11. He's always like, how can we make this the most epic, the most extreme, but also self-aware? It has to be self-aware because if it's not, then people won't take it seriously, especially adults. So he, he has the Death Note characters doing these over-the-top things. There's orchestral music playing, lights literally writing in a notebook like this, <laughs> and throwing things and the papers flying. I didn't want to throw the phone on the actually. The papers are flying. And, uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> papers are flying, he's going crazy. But then there's also scenes where he like dramatically eats a potato chip, and you're like, okay, it's a joke. Like, it's intended to be funny. I get it. I want to participate in the joke. I like it. However, it does make the tone pretty different from the manga. There will be a Q&A afterwards, if there's not. Um, so, I'm just going to move on because I'm losing the steam on Death Note here. Uh, Haruki also came out around the same time, and I would consider it equally important, not nearly as popular um, in the long term. It's kind of died out. Nobody talks about Haruki anymore. I think it's mostly because, what was that? It's so good. I think it's mostly because the IP is kind of been dormant for a while. And then, I mean, the last thing that came out was the Nagato Yuki show, and that was not worth watching. Um, so, you know, not, not as many people care. Back in 2006, this was everything. And the way I found out about Haruki, and this is the, this is the one thing that Kyoto's Animation, all right, hold on, let me take a step back. Let me introduce this. Kyoto's Animation. This studio is very strange. Because whereas most anime studios are located in Tokyo, and they all kind of share lots of animators and staff. It's a very incestuous marketplace anime. Kyoto Animation's in Kyoto. They have no relationship to all that. They're very insular. It's just one consistent group of like mostly women animators, seemingly, who uh, are just out in Kyoto making the best anime on TV. Like, the best looking stuff. They, for some reason, they just have better visuals than other studios. I don't know why. It seems to be that it's because they have better scheduling and just a really talented, well-trained staff. They're never behind on schedule. They don't try to bite off more than they can chew. They only bet on sure things. And they're marketing geniuses. So I guess I do know why. They're so... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, I found out about RP in 2006 because of animated... How do you want me to pronounce it? Raise your hand if you want GIF. Raise your hand if you want GIF. Mm. Alright, GIF is winning. I like GIF winning. <laughs> so, uh, so animated GIFs yeah. were the first way I discovered Haruhi because uh, I would be on forums and people would have in their avatars and banners all these shots of Haruhi of her like groping Mikuru or doing a, a funny head spin or something. And I'm like, what is this? I, I was seeing images from this show because I was in like really hardcore anime communities at the time who were like, you know, watching stuff in Japanese because the show wouldn't be dubbed until about a year later um, after this. But I was just seeing all these gifts, and I'm like, what is this? This is the first show I ever watched fan sub. And I only watched it because I thought it seemed so hyped, because everyone was posting gifts of it. Well, the important thing about this is it's 2006. Gifts were like new to be able to like put in a banner. Like, gifts have been around, but like they are such a huge load that it wasn't until broadband speeds increased that you could actually have gifts like on forums because usually they would ban that kind of stuff for being too too big of an image size. But as that became less of a concern, gifts became a thing. Now, the marketing genius behind this this uh, success is a guy named Yamakan. I have compared myself to Yamakan sometimes because <laughs> um, he's a marketing genius and also the most controversial man in all of anime because he constantly opens his mouth and says things that he shouldn't say. Uh, it's weird. He knows how to market TV shows, but not himself. <laughs> He's uh, real bad about that. He, he has a tendency to say things like, anime is dead and it's all garbage now, and, and uh, I'm going to retire if my next show is not a hit, and then it flopped. So that was, <laughs> that was a fun one. Anyway, he had the idea to make the ending theme of Haruhi a dance, just an unbroken dance sequence with beautiful animation. You might have heard of it, the Hare Hare Yukai dance. Uh, it was a huge deal in anime fandom at the time. If you were going to cons in 2008, you'd be seeing a group of 30 people doing the dance in front of a boombox, you know? Yep. So this, this dance spread like wildfire because they had put out a full, like, if you actually watch the show, the EV is not 
the entire dance, but they put out a video of the full dance. So you could learn it. You could, you know, teach it to your dance class or teach it to a bunch of prisoners. There's a video of that. Uh, don't advise that. It's kind of a human rights violation, but you know, you can make it happen if you are a word in Cuba. I think that's where those come from. Did anyone know what I'm talking about? Have you seen the prisoner dance videos where they interview Thriller? You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah, so animated GIFs. Kill to animation. How many of you have heard of Myriad Colors Phantom World? Was the first thing you ever saw from it a GIF? I think so, yeah. Was it her going under the limbo yes. bar? Yes. Yeah. How many of you have seen a clip of a girl in an orange or yellow shirt going under a limbo bar and her tits are going like this who haven't who didn't raise their hand on the last question? <laughs> there you go. How many of you have heard of uh, the show Chunibyo de Mokoi Gashitai or Love Chunibyo and Other Drugs? If you haven't seen it, you may have seen random clips of high school girls in like red pleated skirts who are dancing like this that's used in like every AMV. Because it's just, there's just so many loopable moments, and they do it on purpose! These people are geniuses, they know what they're doing! They just constantly put scenes in their shows where a character will do a motion like this, and it's so easy to loop it, and so, yeah, all their shows will be everyone's avatar, every, like, when Machunibio came out, everyone had a Rika avatar, because there's just so many cute scenes. It wasn't even that popular of a show, I don't think. But, uh, but you know, everybody knew about it from the gifts. So that, among other things, is their strategy. Obviously, also just making high-quality animation. But um, then they made a show called Lucky Star about a year after Harvey. And the marketing for this show is that it is obsessed with Harvey. Harvey, <laughs> Harvey was a really successful show. Harvey, not unlike Ava, had every character good you could imagine. Every character goods, by the way, are just like products with characters on them. This is like the Japanese. Phrase for it is goods, goods or so goods, goods. I don't know. I'm a racist now, apparently. <laughs> um, so <laughs> anyway, uh, this show is hugely successful. Every character had the, literally side characters in this show had image albums, like albums where the voice actor sings a song about the character, like that that you have to pay fifteen dollars for two tracks. Every character in this show has one of those. Like, even the ones who aren't in this picture. There's like 12. Um, there's tons of albums. There was a huge live show uh, where, you know, all the voice actors were there. They performed songs from the show. You know, Harry's voice actress was wearing a shirt that said, Did you come twice too? Great shirt. Uh, just saying that. It's real. It really happened. Uh, she's actually wearing, it's even got like a naked girl on it and everything. It's crazy. Harry has this big event, it's got all kinds of stuff going on, it's a huge show. Now, the reason Kyoto Animation, I think, did not pursue this show more actively, because it was very strange. The first season, in spite of being so successful, came out in 2006. A second season was not made until 2009, and that season had eight episodes that are literally the same episode, reanimated eight times. No one knows what they were thinking. Then they made a huge movie that everybody loved and didn't touch the franchise again. I think they just wanted to end it on a high note, and then eventually, some other studio did like the offshoots and they weren't good. So I think the main reason for this is Kyoto Animation is one of those studios that I was talking about who really cares about original IPs that they own the rights for. They do not own Haruhi. Making amazing Haruhi shows will not make them any more money than they would just by making bad Haruhi shows because it's just that whatever the committee is going to give them for budget. They're just going to be like, here's your money. Go make another one. And they're like, we want stuff we can market ourselves, which is why they're so proud of like, stuff like Free, where Free was entirely made in-house, that's why it's got two seasons and movies and they market the crap out of it, because you can go to Kyoto Animation's building in Kyoto and buy things from free there because they own it. In a similar way that uh, Trigger, all they own is uh, Luluko and Trigger Chan. So like, that's why they, they put so much Luluko iconography on everything. In fact, I think that's why Luluko exists, is just so that they could have a hub for their IPs and like have a, you know, a sort of symbol. Anyway. Lucky Star, I forgot I was even talking about this show. This show's obsessed with Haruhi because it just so happens, and it makes it totally makes sense in narrative, because this girl right here, Konata, the main character, is a hardcore otaku. And she's a hardcore otaku in 2007. So what is she watching and obsessing with and talking with all the time? Haruhi. Who does she cosplay in the show? Haruhi. What live show does she go to in the show? 
The Haruhi live show, she's voiced by the same voice actress she goes to see her own actress on stage! <laughs> There's a scene where Konata, voiced by Aya Hirano, is standing in this crowd and she sees Aya Hirano singing and she cries because her voice actress is so cool. That's how she feels about her own, <laughs> and her own voice. It's a great show. Um, they both are. And, uh, Lucky Star was actually not that successful at first, especially in Japan. Um, the first four episodes were not well liked. The director, Yamaka, same guy from over here, was fired from Kyoto Animation. I was just, it, it, it was said that he was just not, basically they, were, they, they, were, they, they said some really vague stuff about why they let him go, like he just wasn't running up to satisfaction, you know? I've never seen a director get fired from a show before. I've never really seen that in anime, so as far as I'm concerned, it's probably just because he's I think that's why they wanted him gone, because nobody likes Yamaka. He is a, he's a real trash talker. Monogatari. So this is probably, you know, it was just him. I thought I heard like people shuffling their pants or something, but I couldn't stop. Uh, anyway, it was just, it's just me projecting. Um, so this is the Monogatari girls. The, mo the marketing for Monogatari, uh, sorry I pronounced it that way by the way. Um, the marketing for Monogatari is uh, that it has the hottest cast of all time, basically. Um, they got this artist, Akio Watanabe, who's a long time otaku media extraordinaire. This guy's been uh, drawing cute girls since the 90s and worked with this director before. That basically, they crafted this show to be the ultimate otaku bait show. It's based on a light novel which uh, is basically a, a format of book only read by otaku. It is, it means it's ubu, it's for us, by us, it's our media, it's, it's light novels. So this is a light novel about light novels, in a way, because um, Nisi always seen everything he writes is extremely meta and circular, and that's what anime fans like, is meta and circular. That's why I'm doing this presentation. It's all meta and circular, just like that sentence. So, yeah, um, Man, I don't, I don't even, I don't, I'm, I don't know how, what time I have left. You have 15 minutes. I have 15 minutes? Okay. Then I should stretch this out as long as I possibly can. How do I make it big again? Okay. Anyway, uh, so I'm going to stare at this for a second so I can figure out how to market this show. <sighs> Basically, they did the same thing with Harvey. They made a, a million character goods. Oh, now I remember what was unique about this one. I tried to pick shows I had something unique to say about them, so I wouldn't just be going through the same thing again. The unique thing about this show is that it's not finished, and that somehow worked in its favor. Because when they sent this show to TV, half the fight scenes were just not there. It would just say, like, black screen for, like, 45 seconds, because they had not finished it yet before it went to animation. So if you watch like episodes like seven and nine of the original before they, you know, if you were to watch it online now, of course they replaced it all with the uh, Blu-ray release because who wants to watch the TV version? But yeah, there's tons of unfinished scenes in the show. And because other than that fact, the show is really good, Otaku really liked it, uh, and they wanted to see the finished version, this had the highest Blu-ray sales of all time by a landslide. This crushed everything because they just made the perfect otaku media, and then they made it so you had to pay for it to get the best version of it. So there you go. I don't know if they did it, I doubt they did it intentionally. I don't think any studio, you know, takes, takes something to print unfinished intentionally. Now, I will say a lot of them censor stuff intentionally. Um, I didn't put it on here, but there's a little show called Kodomo no Jikan. Um, yeah, somebody's heard of it. <laughs> laugh when you hear sound of Dave. Um, it's it's a it's a lolly show. It's it's known for it's known for being like the most lolly show. But when they uh, aired the anime, they put these gigantic sensor things on everything. It was basically, the the symbol no, the Japanese symbol no, which is in the title, had, like they, in the title it has a little orange circle around it. They put this big orange circle over like every frame of the show. But like, when you actually watched the DVD version, nothing that was happening was that risque. None of it would have involved covering nearly the amount of the screen they were showing. 
And it's very obvious that because they were trying to market this, it's like, hey, hey, don't you guys want to see some lollies? You know, like, you got to buy the DVDs. We covered the whole screen. You can't even tell what's happening. And then you watch the final version, and you're like, literally, I could have just watched porn. It would have been way better. Um, so, Maho Shoujo Madoka Magica. Same people as Monogatari, same, uh, same studio, same producers, same, uh, you know, same idea. So we made the show the biggest show of all time, which it was. It, uh, it actually knocked out Monogatari and became the new biggest selling Blu ray show, I think. Or it was right underneath it or something like that. Um, this one has the craziest marketing, the most fun, the best. It's not even that it's complicated, it's just that what they did is really hilarious. So, Madoka Magica was conceptualized by an anime director called uh, Akin Kishimbo. He had the idea. He had previously worked on magical girl shows aimed at adults. <laughs> so, like, if you've ever heard of Maho Shoujo Lyrical Nanoha, he was the director of that. He's, it was just a show that, like, has the attitude of a magical girl show for kids, kind of. Like, everything's about friendship and hearts, and, like, all the girls are super innocent and adorable little girls. However, it's very clearly marketed at otaku, partly because little girls get undressed sometimes, and partly because there's a space-time administration bureau, and they travel between dimensions and solve international space crime. So that's part of it. That gets introduced out of nowhere, not the way. You're just like watching a magical girl show, and then it hard cuts to a spaceship, and it says space-time administration bureau on screen. And you're like, oh, oh, <laughs> all right. Guess that's where this is going. So. Uh, what does he hard cut to in this case? Uh, a girl getting her head bitten off by a giant monster, in case you don't know. Uh, who here has not seen Madoka? Uh, do you care about spoilers? No. Okay, good. Yes. <laughs> um, so this, this show, the marketing for this show, because this director, he, he wanted to make an, like a, a more adult magical girl show, and he decided to to, uh, to hire on this writer named Urobuchi Gen, a.k.a. Butch Gen, a.k.a. Gen the Butcher. Gen the Butcher was known for mostly writing erotic visual novels of the Guro category, which means, this whole, which means that he writes a lot of gore, and uh, people, you know, people uh, in uh, unhealthy sexual relationships? <laughs> there you go. That's a PG way of putting it. Um, so, Butch Gen, not only are all of his games violent, horrific, Lovecraftian nightmares, he's also co-president of a, of a visual novel company called Nitro Plus, who produced Steins Gate, um, and lots of uh, like Guro and like crazy weird porn games. So, uh, so, this guy, he gets hired on to write Madoka Magica. Now, everybody knows Butch Gen as the guy who writes dark stuff. His first anime that he wrote a script for is called Blast Rider. Spoilers for this show, none of you are going to watch it. Everyone dies. So uh, that's how he became known as Get the Butcher. So they start putting out promo art for Madoka, and all of it's cutesy and pink and adorable, and all the promo art was just like, this is a magical girl show. Look at them, they're bad, they're, they're cool, they're like, they got weapons, but they're cute. The character designers, the same person who did Hinamari Sketch, which was a very low-key slice of life show from the same director from years before. You know, so cutesy aesthetic, she draws lots of Yuri manga as well, so maybe a little Yuri's gonna be here. Like, this obviously is aimed at otaku. It's obviously not for little girls. Um, you can pretty much tell that from the character designs. Um, and if you were to watch the first couple episodes of the show, it immediately feels off. Like, the show is kind of twisted and strange, and the aesthetic's really weird, but you're like, okay, I guess this is a magical girl show. But here's, here's the marketing. They, because they knew, again, again, the butcher was known for this, they told him, the, well, first they tried to just not announce that he was on the project. They were like, let's just make sure nobody knows that Butch Gen's on this, because then they'll know it's going to be, it's going to be bad, it's going to be, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but uh, but they, they couldn't keep it secret, so they just told him to go on Twitter and lie, and say that he was turning over a new leaf, and he was trying to make something really, like, he, he just wanted to make something nice and pleasant for once. He said this. He went on Twitter and just lied. It just was like, yeah, I'm writing a nice magical girl show. That's what I'm doing. So everybody believed it. To the point, uh, one of my friends, an anime blogger called Otosan, at the time, had written a post about episode one where he was like, 
maybe this is just Shinbo's warped idea of what a pleasant time is. Because the first episode's already really like dark. They are. I mean, you, most of you see it.